Simple as it is in premise, Counter-Strike might actually be the most complex FPS ever created. With unique spray patterns, batshit crazy utility lineups, and a full-scale in-game economy, improving your gameplay can be a pretty daunting experience. But there is one aspect of the game that you must, at the very least, become competent at if you want to actually, as they say, get good. It's something that the average player might not bother practicing, but when used correctly, it can absolutely take your game to the next level. Twist, talk about his impact. This will be some time to find out the rat in the hole. Do you consider that? He's in. Look. Oh! He's in. And he slaps him down. Back of the skull. No, Twist looking. Breaks Nobby's backs. In the dying stages of regulation. As they're gone. 15. I am, of course, talking about that mystical, ethereal, all-encompassing construct known as movement. And look at this, what on earth, nifty, wow. Movement, boy, oh, oh, my God. God. From a two versus four, but he's gonna hold the plate, that gives Keo a chance, and he makes it work perfectly. Has done a tremendous, tremendous, excuse me, job of doing so, drop step right to find two oh. on the ladder. Oh, has he done that? Bunny hopping is one of those things that can provide a massive advantage in certain situations. And many of the world's best players know how to use it to maximize their movement across the map. But what exactly is B hopping? And how important is it for the average player? Well, lucky for you, today we're gonna find out. Okay, so before we start talking about them crispy hops, I must ask that you like the channel. Nope, like the video, subscribe to the channel, and turn on notifications. Also, be sure to check out our brand new line of merch. We got t-shirts, crews, hoodies, and I can honestly say, bias aside, that aside from being very well made, the thing I really like about this clothing is that it fits me like a glove. I know a lot of y'all are like, 5'9", or at least act like it in the comments, but I'm almost 6'5", and it's genuinely very hard for me to find long clothing. So this stuff actually fits me like a glove. Okay, so even though bunny hopping, or bee hopping for short, has actually been a crucial aspect of Counter-Strike's gameplay for years, gamers were messing around with it years before Counter-Strike even existed. Shortly after Quake released back in 1996, players realized that by continually jumping in a consistent rhythm, they could actually move much faster than if they had just run in a straight line. In fact, running forward was just about the slowest way you could get around in the original Quake. Even strafing from side to side around corners was quicker. But when combining strafing with jumping, players were able to reach the game's maximum movement threshold because no velocity was lost while your character was airborne. You'd only lose speed when you touched the ground without continuing your air strafe. At the time, this technique was given the name strafe jumping. And although it wasn't actually very common within the multiplayer community, it was a necessity for the game's speedrunning community. Unfortunately, Quake's developer, id Software, weren't really thrilled that fans were finding ways to exploit the game's movement infrastructures and tried removing it from future titles. But in 1998, Valve released one of the most influential FPS games ever, Half-Life. Half-Life was built on a modded version of the original Quake engine called Gold Source. And while id Software was trying their absolute darndest to remove movement exploits from their game, Valve didn't really seem to mind. Big surprise. Soon, players began speedrunning Half-Life and perfecting their strafe jumping mechanics while pushing to improve their times. But Half-Life also introduced a new type of movement, wall strafing. By pushing your character into walls at specific angles, you were able to gain additional speed. So speedrunners made use of all these mechanics to complete each and every level as quickly as possible. Before we move on, it should be noted that speedrunners such as these used the scroll wheel to jump. And 
Since then, pretty much every Valve title has benefited from this keybind. In fact, it's become the sort of calling card of Counter-Strike's movement community at large. By tying one's jump bind to each and every notch of the scroll wheel, spinning a said wheel all but guarantees that you won't miss the timing on a particular hop. Anyway, Half-Life's modding community was pretty extensive, and in 1999, it birthed the ever-goated Half-Life Counter-Strike. Due to the popularity of the mod, Valve approached the creators just a year later and purchased the intellectual property, publishing the polished version of the game in September of the year 2000. But bunny hopping and Counter-Strike was unlike anything that came before it. Because while Half-Life speedrunners had been using the technique to best their own times in single player runs, CS offered a multiplayer game mode, which eventually spawned an even larger pro scene. The benefits of bunny hopping in a competitive environment were, of course, self-explanatory. They made you a harder target to hit, since it forced enemies to sort of track your sporadic movement. But it also helped players learn skill jumps. And once modders began creating KZ and B-Hop and even surf maps, practicing movement became pretty routine. I think KZ in 1.6 is like the, the best movement in any game. It's uh, very natural and it's very, uh, very soothing. Bunny hopping in particular became even more popular with the release of Counter-Strike Source. But this was in large part thanks to one player. And if you know anything at all about bunny hopping, then you know who it is I'm talking about. But for all the Zoomers out there, pun very much intended, it is time to discuss the goat that is Foon. I can hear the music now. Foon's Too Much for Z-Block was a masterpiece. It was the perfect montage of movement, frags, and of course, BM. That single 10-minute video is a seminal entry in the history of Counter-Strike-related media and mythology, and it turned him into a literal legend. But Foon was so good at b-hopping that some players actually questioned whether he was legit. Had he really mastered the game's movement, or was he creating these clips with the use of automated scripts? If you're asking me if I think he was legit, the answer is yes. That being said, People just forget that like before some of the restrictions on movement and stuff like that, it's not easy, but just that it was very doable. There were a lot of movement things in Source that were very forgiving and by no means was it easy and I could not do it. Like when I had to play against him, there were times where I straight up would not leave CT spawn on nuke. Like I would just wait for him because I knew he'd try it every round. Like you knew like, so in a way it was kind of like bad to have him on your team because he was either getting, you know, these crazy ridiculous kills or he's an absolute liability. Now, from what Flom told me, Foon did actually attend some small lands where he was able to showcase his clean hops. Unfortunately, they weren't exactly recorded for posterity. Only a handful of people got to witness Foon and his shenanigans in the flesh. And although he sort of intentionally faded away into obscurity, there's almost no overstating the foundational role that this mysterious man played in both pioneering and popularizing bunny hopping as a whole. Really, I think Foon really pushed the boundaries and, and like showed people like what was possible with movement, right? It's obviously not something that's always tangible in like competitive games, but he did kind of pave this path for all these different movement players in CS now, which is honestly, I think very enjoyable to watch. A lot of it is owed to people like Foon, who uh, really kind of opened the gates for having movement be this thing that you can pursue and, and have that be like that kind of skill that you can kind of prioritize more so than even your aim and your uh, game sense and everything else. So I think it's really cool. By the time CSGO released in 2012, pretty much anyone who took Counter-Strike seriously was, at the very least, aware of their movement. And although you definitely don't see pro players bunny hopping around the map in every pro match, hitting the right hop at the right time can absolutely make a difference in even the most basic of gunfights. 
potentially a second critical error in the opening six rounds. Oh. Rogi, quick movements, just trying to dodge, dive okay. back into the fight. Okay, okay. The indirect kind of benefit of knowing how to bunny hop and having good movement will just improve your overall prowess in the game mechanically when it comes to using your movement to win aim duels or get to places faster or to make little little skill jumps that are in the game in, uh, in CSGO. Even a well-timed surf can give way to an absolutely decadent dumpstering. Ooh, 10 hundred points to Gryffindor. Of course, most of us aren't named Zywoo. But learning to finesse one's movement can absolutely elevate even a gold Nova player's game. And luckily, there are no shortage of resources to learn how to do it. Nowadays, there is a near endless number of community servers one can connect to and workshop maps one can download in order to master one's movement. Now, a lot of people, myself included, play these maps because they're fun and relaxing. But the skills that can be refined while playing them can eventually translate into real matches, regardless of what rank you are. I mean, it wasn't really like a thing that like, I was like, consciously trying to improve it was just, just the thing that I, I found fun and it was another thing that i could improve on right it wasn't like i was thinking like oh if i can learn how to you know do surf kitsune in like a minute then i can become uh you know rank g on esc or something you just see yourself improve in certain aspects of the game and movement is just a big part of that uh, you can just see yourself, you can tell when, it, when a player has good movement, when a player has bad movement in CSGO very easily. So if you're a CS player and you are not at the very least aware as to how hopping works, then honestly, you're kind of trolling. Now, if you're asking yourself, how do I go about learning how it works? Fortunately, I forced Colton to learn how it works so he could explain it to you. And now the guy who actually knows what he's talking about. You want me to what? So let me get this straight. You call me the guy who actually knows what he's talking about, then write a bunch of scripts about Counter-Strike and Valorant, and now you want me to teach people how to bunny hop? I thought this was a tech show. Okay, in Counter-Strike, when running in a straight line with your knife out, your character's max velocity is 250 units per second, a measurement of speed that's almost as meaningless as whatever Americans are using. The goal of executing a clean bunny hop is to surpass that velocity. So let's break down the tech one input at a time. First of all, you probably wanna bind your jump to your scroll wheel. Like the guy who should actually be explaining this, Dimitri mentioned earlier, it will make it much harder to miss your jump timing. To start the bunny hop, press your W key or S key depending on which direction you wanna go. Once you start jumping, release the key and use both A and D in order to gain velocity. You can also B hop from side to side by starting with A or D and then strafing with W and S. Just remember to keep moving your mouse in rhythm with your b-hops, otherwise you'll slow down. But don't be discouraged if you can't nail it immediately. It can take a while to learn how to execute clean b-hops. Or an eternity, in fact, if, like me, you don't play the game. But your efforts won't go unrewarded, because nothing feels better than hitting that perfect sh movement. And that was the guy who actually knows what he's talking about. Plenty of modern titles use some sort of movement mechanics. But before we wrap things up, we gotta talk about Valorant. I know, I'm sorry, but like most things in Valorant, bunny hopping is a hell of a lot easier than it is in CSGO. Mostly because it doesn't really exist. In Valorant, bunny hopping is, is close to useless um, because you can't actually get any sort of velocity boost. You can't get from point A to point B faster by bunny hopping. If anything, if you mess up, you're probably gonna end up there slower. So I really don't like how the skill ceiling for movement in Valorant is so low. It's like super duper low. It, seems, it feels really um, just like really static, you know? Um, there isn't a whole, a whole lot of flexibility with the movement. What Riot did was essentially give players the illusion of being able to bunny hop in the interest of making the game more accessible and appealing to a casual player base. 
Since there are agents who have their own dedicated movement abilities, it was probably a good decision from Riot. We've already seen players push the boundaries of what's possible for these agents, and it has made for some pretty insane plays so far. Oh, here he goes, and, and it's a little bit of what we saw, right? The flash, the go, the gravity well, just like what we saw in round one, and sick. For, in the first round, it was Dapper. This round, it was Sick, who tastes a little bit of that bunny bunny action. Bunny hopping has come a long way since the early days of Quake and Half-Life and even CS. And yet, in other ways, it's sort of stayed exactly the same. There's a good chance that the FPS game that you play today has some sort of bee hopping mechanic built into it. So hopefully, after today, some of you will consider putting a little bit of extra time into practicing your movement rather than just your aim. It might be more useful for some shooters than others, but I think we can all agree that mastering one's movement is just straight up fun. Probably not. Do you watch Peaky Blinders? It's an English, like a very English uh, TV show about um, Birmingham in the 1920s and 30s. If you don't watch the show, it's not gonna mean as much to you, but Danny does the most unbelievable impression. We never would let him get away with this in France. Never in France, Arthur. Oh, sorry there. Oh, sorry, bud. 